Hello there. Irish author Erica McGann is rapidly becoming one of the most successful children's authors in the country. With titles such as The Demon Notebook, The Broken Spell, The Watching Wood and The Fairy Tale Trap, her books feature young Grace and her friends as they struggle with different magic powers and spells. One of the most enjoyable novels I've read this year was Erica's most recent book, The Midnight Carnival, more about which later. But first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Erica to this News Desk special, Meet the Author. Erica, thank you very much for joining us. You must be delighted with the success of your book so far. I am, yeah. I think I'm so lucky there's been there's been four novels so far and five books altogether. So yeah, it's it's been really nice, it's been great. And what's the one you're working on at the moment? I'm working on a new series for a slightly younger audience called uh, Cass and the Bubble Street Gang is the name of the series. And the first book is out in spring and it's called The Clubhouse Mystery. So it's a, it's a group of friends who have their kind of secret club and they have a secret clubhouse and they solve mysteries and investigate crime and basically have great adventures. And is this book, um, is this the first one without Grace and, and, and her friends? Yeah, this is a brand new series. So Cass uh, is the girl, Cass O'Cara is the main, the main one of this and she has two friends, Lex and Nicholas, who are her gang. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very different and it's not supernatural. So this is something very different for me, which has been great fun. What, what decided you to sort of change direction? Um, well, I was interested in doing something just slightly younger, something a little bit shorter. And for this one, I get to have illustrations, which is fantastic. I get to see my characters, you know, have their, their faces out there, which is really, really nice. So I just wanted to have a go at something a little bit different. And I love the supernatural, but just to take a little break from the supernatural for a little bit. How, how far ahead do you plan the story when you're writing it? Um, I mean, do you know where it's going to end before you start? I usually do, yes. When I was doing the, the Demon Notebook series, I planned each of them. The, the Demon Notebook was the first book I'd ever written and I didn't know how to write a book when I started. So I definitely planned that out um, very well and I pretty much did that for the whole of the series. I would always know, have the beginning, know the ending and I would have the main points in between. Um, for Cass, I'd be doing the same because they're a little bit shorter and you can't wander off and get lost because you can, you've only got a limited number of pages. Um, but when I'm doing other things for myself, I do tend to just write with no plan and just see where it goes, which is very exciting, but it's not very disciplined. Well, and, and it's not the sort of thing you'd recommend for, for children to do no, either. No, you no, know. I wouldn't recommend it, definitely. If you're writing something short or if you're getting into writing for the first time, I would definitely say plan it because it makes it so much easier for you. It basically gives you stepping stones across the river. If you don't have stepping stones, you get washed down and you may never find the ending. But if you have stepping stones all the way, it makes it much easier to get across. Right, when you say stepping stones, do you mean little points throughout the yeah, story where so you know something will happen? or Exactly. So I usually do, I did a timeline where I'd have the beginning, I'd have pretty much what I know what the ending would be. And then in between, I would have the major plot points. So introducing major characters, the big challenges they faced. And it meant that there was still a little bit of mystery because I didn't plan every single thing. You could still have a little bit of mystery in between the major plot points. So it's still fun for you but it means that you've got a straight line and stepping stones to get where you need to go. How important is it when you're writing to have an idea about the, the character in your own head? I mean, how, how do you develop you know, a character into sort of what, you know, what skills and their personality? It's, it's really important to know your character very well because they're going to direct you know, how your story goes and how it develops. And I find the easiest thing to do is to base a character on somebody you know because you know how your best friend talks, you know what they look like, you know what they're interested in, and then change it up a little bit so it's not exactly your best friend. I always, I always tell kids in sessions when they're basing characters on people they know, always change the name and always change the character enough that they you know, might not recognise themselves because I, I based the, the characters in the Demon Notebook series on my friends in school who I'm still very close with and mostly they were delighted but I had one friend who said to me, this, this girl Aidy who's afraid of everything, is that me? And I thought Aidy was a lovely character, I think she's wonderful but my friend was not happy about it so I lied <laughs> and I told her no, it's a mix of this person and this person, it's not you. Oh. Yeah, so always have a little bit of a change in there so that your characters are not instantly recognisable as real people. That, that sounds like <laughs> sensible advice. Um, to me, one of the parts of the success of Eric's, uh, Erica's books is that her stories have this atmosphere of suspense that uh, leave you eager to read more to discover what's going to happen next. So look, uh, just sit back for a few minutes and relax uh, while Erica sets the scene inside the Midnight Carnival tent as the show is about to begin. 
Music pumped through the main tent, reverberating through the tarpaulin walls. The air was heavy inside with so many people crammed into the space, and the tiered seating surrounded a circle of dry dirt in the centre. Grace wondered if the town council would go mad when they found a big chunk of Dunbridge Park reduced from green grass to dusty soil. Aidy had not been forthcoming about how exactly she got the free tickets to the show. She looked a bit guilty when asked, which was weird, but nobody complained, especially since they'd been reserved seats in the front row. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringmaster, complete with top hat and red coat, materialised before the bustling audience. My name is Felix Renault, and I welcome you to the Carnival de Minuit. People rushed to take their seats. The show was about to begin. A small, dainty figure descended from the ceiling on a thick white rope. I won't bore you by flattering my own performers. I won't give you the hard sell. I'll just tell you this. The ringmaster's eyes darkened. The Minwi experience is one you will never forget. To begin, La Belle Justine. In a flash of red, he was gone, and the figure on the rope tumbled, apparently out of control. The audience gasped until she stopped abruptly, only a metre off the ground. Balancing on one foot, still wrapped in rope, the girl grinned wickedly. She was no more than 13 or 14 years old, and dressed in ballet pumps and a pink leotard with shorts. But it wasn't her outfit that made Grace stare, it was her face for the lower half of the young girl's face was completely covered in a thick beard of soft brown hair, ending in one twirling curl beneath her chin. Some nerveless chuckling rippled through the audience as people began to notice, but the girl seemed unaffected. She tipped backwards and climbed the rope feet first like Spider-Man, then wrapped one leg and spun around with alarming speed. Grace and the others joined in the oohs and ahs as the bearded ballerina curled herself into impossible positions, arching her back to press the soles of her feet against the back of her head, stretching into the splits with only one leg entwined by the rope. Grace hadn't seen the tightrope positioned two-thirds of the way to the ceiling until Justine somersaulted onto it. The girl then performed a beautiful tightrope ballet, pirouettes and turns, elegant arches with one foot raised in the air, all the while balanced on the thin cords suspended many metres above the tent floor. It was stunning and terrifying at the same time, and it wasn't until the girl snatched the rope and slid to the ground for a bow that Grace realised she'd been holding her breath. That was amazing, Rachel breathed. Yeah, holy cow, said Jenny. She could have fallen and broken her neck. That was awesome. Why does she have a beard? asked Aidy. Don't know, replied Grace. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's fake, said Jenny. It looks pretty real to me. A number of acts followed, including a strong woman with rippling muscles who threw an anvil like it was made of cardboard, a mystical sorcerer whose light display was like fireworks inside the tent, and two brothers, conjoined twins, who sang such a haunting melody that Grace swore her heart was breaking. But as the end of the show drew near, the lighting dimmed and the ringmaster reappeared. Ladies and gentlemen, he said solemnly, they make you laugh but they may also make you cry. The melancholy clowns. Grace disliked them instantly. They were unlike any troop of clowns she'd ever seen, creeping into the ring like furtive creatures and tumbling silently towards the audience. Their tattered silk suits, even when brand new, would not have been jolly. They were mostly grim shades of gray, purple and brown, with some muted red and yellow stripes. Their makeup was so heavy that their eyes disappeared into their faces and their large, fake grins stood out horribly. The melancholy clowns cartwheeled and somersaulted, crashing into each other in the way clowns usually do. But there was nothing fun about this performance. They didn't laugh uproariously and point at each other. And when they fell, it was like slow motion. They drifted mournfully to the ground. They rolled and jumped, but their slippered feet were completely silent. There was no music either, and Grace couldn't fathom how there wasn't a single sound from the six performers. There was an air of discomfort, and the audience seemed reluctant to break the silence. In the final sequence, three clowns tiptoed around the front row, each holding a finger to their lips, as two of their companions wheeled a huge cannon from behind the back curtain. Grace shuddered as one silent performer crept past her. Up close, his white makeup was dry and cracked, his eyes too deep, and his grin unfriendly. The cannon was aimed at the final unsuspecting clown who stood distracted, breathing in the scent of a wilting lily in his hand. The fuse was lit and the fizzing, hissing sound was all that could be heard until BANG! The awful crack of the cannon made the spectators shriek with fright. As the smoke cleared, a clown lay lifeless on the ground, his crushed lily beside him. The painted face nearest to Grace turned slowly and smiled. 
What is it with clowns? I mean, why do you think they are so, so hugely creepy? I, I sometimes wonder that myself. I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I think it has a lot to do with the painted faces. I think that you have this thick layer of makeup and it's no matter what a clown is feeling, it has this huge fake grin plastered on itself. So I think it's about, um, it's somebody who's constantly hiding something. And I think that's what makes them slightly eerie and slightly creepy. And that they always have a slightly, even clowns that are very funny have a melancholy edge, which, which makes them a kind of sad edge, which makes them a little bit, um, unnerving, I think, is the word, probably. M were you aware that, I mean, quite recently there's been a whole spate of these killer clowns that, you know, have appeared up all around the place. I, I take it you're willing to take responsibility for this? I'll take full blame for that. It's yeah. absolutely my fault, yeah. Yeah, that, that scares, it really scares me, the idea of a clown popping up, in the, you know, in a car park or in the street. Or I, th I honestly think I would lose my reason if it happened in real life. I'm fine with it in books and I'm fine writing about them. I have no desire to meet one in real life. But, on the I mean, there, there, there's such an array of, of unique and strange and, you know, fascinating characters in the, in the Midnight Carnival. How did you sort of, or what did you draw on to, to uh, create those people? Well, I drew on everything I'd kind of ever seen or read about carnivals or circuses, and there's so much of it out there, and there's so many books that were kind of based around um, the, that carnival circus setting and so many TV programs. And they would always, like, for instance, there would always kind of be a bearded lady included among them. So I had an aerial acrobat who had, uh, you know, a young girl who had, a, who had a beard. And there would always be a contortionist, and there would always be a ringmaster. So I took kind of the, the, the main characters that always show up in carnivals and circuses and tried to kind of condense them down into mostly into young characters that the girls could interact with. Sadly, we're almost out of time, but before we leave you, Erica has an exciting writing challenge for you all. I chose a spooky carnival for the setting of this story because I could include lots of unusual and creepy characters. I want you to think of somewhere really creepy where you'd hate to be lost and alone. Visualise it in your mind, then write a short description of the place using lots of interesting adjectives to help your readers visualise this spooky setting. Type your spooky setting description on a Word document and then copy and paste it into the send a comment section at the bottom of this page. One week from now, Erica will pick the three best ones and they'll receive free copies of the Midnight Carnival to read and enjoy. So, Erica, thanks for being with us today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed meeting the author. Until next time, bye-bye.